way at 4 p.m. Eastern. And now CBO Director Douglas Elmendorf. Good morning. I'm Doug Elmendorf, the Director of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, thank you all for coming. CBO has just released an update to our previous budget and economic projections. I will briefly summarize the projections, beginning with the budget and then turning to the economy. And then my colleagues and I will be happy to try to answer any questions that you have. The federal budget deficit has fallen sharply during the past few years and is on a path to decline further this year and next. But later in the coming decade, under current law, the gap between spending and revenues would grow again relative to the size of the economy, and federal debt would climb. To be specific, we estimate that the deficit for this fiscal year will amount to $506 billion, about $170 billion lower than the deficit in 2013. At 2.9% 2 of gross domestic product, or GDP, this year's deficit will be much smaller than those of recent years. Looking ahead, CBO's baseline projections show what we think would happen if current laws governing taxes and spending generally remain unchanged. Those baseline projections are designed to serve as a benchmark for policymakers to use when considering possible changes to laws. According to our updated baseline projections, the deficit would remain less than 3% of GDP through 2018, but would grow thereafter, reaching nearly 4% from 2022 through 2024. Federal outlays will be boosted in the coming decade by four key factors. The retirement of the baby boom generation, the expansion of federal subsidies for health insurance, rising health care costs per person, and increasing interest rates. Given those factors and under current law, spending in three key components of the budget would grow faster than the economy. Those components are Social Security, the major health care programs, including Medicare, Medicaid, and subsidies provided through exchanges, and net interest payments. In contrast, spending in three other broad categories would shrink markedly relative to the size of the economy. That includes so-called mandatory spending other than that for Social Security and health care, as well as both defense and non-defense discretionary spending. Outlays in those three categories taken together would fall to their lowest percentage of GDP since 1940, the earliest year for which comparable data have been reported. Of the total projected increase in spending over the next decade, the major health care programs, Social Security, and net interest account for 85 percent, and all other programs account for just 15 percent. Total outlays would reach about 22 percent of GDP by 2024, a little above their average for the past 40 years. Total revenues would also be above their historical average relative to GDP, but to a smaller extent. Revenues are projected to jump by about 9% next year because of both provisions of law that have recently taken effect, such as the expiration of certain tax provisions, and the ongoing economic expansion. After 2015, we expect that revenue would change little relative to GDP under current law because of various offsetting factors. Those paths for federal outlays and revenues would push federal debt relative to the size of the economy even higher. We expect that federal debt held by the public will reach 74% of GDP at the end of this fiscal year, more than twice what it was in 2007 and higher than in any year since 1950. And in our baseline projections, that debt reaches 77% of GDP in 2024 and is on an upward trajectory. Such large and growing federal debt would have serious negative consequences, including increasing federal spending for interest payments, restraining economic growth in the long term, giving policymakers less flexibility to respond to unexpected challenges, and eventually increasing the risk of a fiscal crisis. Our budget projections are built on our economic forecast, which anticipates that the economy will grow slowly this year on balance, and then at a faster but still moderate pace over the next few years. The gap between the nation's output and its potential or maximum sustainable output will narrow to its historical average by the end of 2017, we expect, largely eliminating the underuse of labor that now exists. Real GDP, that is GDP adjusted for inflation, grew at an annual rate of only about 1% during the first half of this calendar year, but we expect stronger growth in the second half. 
All told, we estimate that real GDP will increase by 1.5% from the fourth quarter of 2013 through the fourth quarter of 2014. After this year, we anticipate that real GDP growth will pick up to about 3.5% next year and the year after. In our view, growth will strengthen for a few principal reasons. First, in response to increased demand for their products, businesses will increase their investments in new structures and equipment at a faster pace and will continue to expand their workforces. Second, consumer spending will grow more rapidly, spurred by recent gains in household wealth and, with an improving labor market, gains in labor income. And third, fewer vacant housing units, more rapid formation of new households, and further improvement in mortgage markets will lead to larger increases in home building. The faster growth of output will reduce the amount of underused productive resources, or slack, in the economy. We think that a significant amount of slack remains in the labor market today, despite notable improvements in recent quarters, but that it will be largely eliminated during the next few years. The current slack in the labor market consists of a few main elements. First, the unemployment rate is elevated. Second, the participation rate in the labor force is well below what we estimate would be achieved if the demand for workers was stronger. And third, the share of part-time workers who would prefer full-time work is significantly higher than it was before the recession. One important signal that significant slack remains in the labor market is that wages and salaries continue to grow slowly. To assess the impact of the weakness in the labor market, suppose that in the second quarter of this year, the unemployment rate had returned to its pre-recession level and the labor force participation rate was up at the rate that we think could be achieved if more jobs were available. Then, according to our estimates, about three and three quarters million more people would be employed than actually were. But we emphasize in our report that measuring slack is quite difficult and the current amount of slack could be a good deal larger or smaller than we estimate. By the end of 2017, we expect that the gap between GDP and potential GDP will have narrowed to its historical average. Between 2018 and 2024, we project that real GDP will grow by an average of 2.2% per year, a rate that is noticeably less than the average growth of output during the 1980s and 1990s. That slower projected pace reflects a number of factors, including the retirement of members of the baby boom generation, a relatively stable labor force participation rate for working women after decades of strong increases, uh, and the effects of federal tax and spending policies embodied in current law. The gradual elimination of slack in the economy will eventually remove the downward pressure on the rate of inflation and on interest rates that has existed in the past several years. We anticipate that the rate of inflation, as measured by the price index for personal consumption expenditures, will move up during the next several years to the Federal Reserve's goal of 2%. We project that the interest rate on three-month Treasury bills will remain near zero until the second half of next year and then increase substantially, reaching 3.5% in 2019 and later years. And we project that the rate on 10-year Treasury notes will continue to increase, reaching 4.7% in 2019 and later years. Let me conclude by returning to the budget. Last month, CBO extrapolated its previous baseline projections beyond the standard 10-year period showing that under current law, there would be a substantial imbalance in the federal budget over the long term. By 25 years from now, rising budget deficits would push federal debt held by the public to more than 100% of GDP, a level seen only once before in our history at the end of the Second World War. Federal debt in 2024 under CBO's current baseline is very similar to what we had previously projected for that year, so the long-term outlook remains about the same. Under current law, debt would be quite high by historical standards and on an upward path relative to the size of the economy, a trend that would impose significant costs and could not be sustained indefinitely. Thank you. I will stop there. Um, my colleagues and I are happy to answer your questions. Please start by saying who you are and uh, who you work for. Yes. Paul Krozak, CQ Roll Call. Yes, Paul. Um, so in terms of your economic <coughs> forecast, comparing it to when you did it back in February, uh, your economic forecast over the 10 years is a little weaker than, than it was before, but is that all because it's weaker in 2014 and is the same for the rest of the decade? We have um, revised down the growth rate 
for output in 2014, a fair bit, as you know. We have not changed the growth rates in subsequent years very much. And when you put the issue that way, it sounds like most of the action is in this year. But that's not quite right, because uh, we did also revise down our estimate of the level of potential output, maximum sustainable output, in the later years of the decade. If we had not revised down that uh, estimate of potential output, then we would have thought that eventually the economy would make up for the weaker growth in the first half of this year by stronger growth sometime later. Uh, and the down revision to uh, potential output for later in the decade was not very large, about 1%, and reflects a combination of factors, one of which is weaker uh, business investment, uh, thus leading to somewhat slower growth of capital services than we had previously expected. There are also some changes on the, on the labor market side. But those are pretty small, pretty small differences. And our basic reaction to the uh, un, uh, unexpected weakness in the first quarter of the year was to see that by the second quarter, growth seemed to be stronger uh, really across the board, uh, across the major components of spending. Uh, and labor market improvement continued uh, during the first half of the year despite the very weak GDP growth in the first quarter. So although this was certainly um, disappointing relative to our expectations to have such slow growth at the beginning of the year, uh, we did not take a, a great signal from that uh, for the longer term prospects for the economy. And the changes we did make in the longer term, as I said, were small um, and stem from a collection of factors. Yes. Yeah, well, the New York Times. Would yes. you discuss if your growth projections for the coming years prove overly optimistic, as they have for recent years, what the impact is likely to be on the federal budget and the federal deficit? Yes, yeah, so the trade off between interest rates and, and uh, revenues. Um, so uh, we have expected uh, output growth to pick up uh, for a number of years now beyond what has happened. And um, our assessment of that is that the shadow of the financial crisis, uh, the housing boom and bust, um, the damage to households' balance sheets and to their confidence, um, had that shadow. Uh, lasted longer than we had thought it would. Um, additionally, as you know, there was um, the very sharp reductions in budget deficits over the past several years have meant on the other side a uh, reduction in the stimulus fiscal policies providing for the economy. Um, at this point, uh, underlying financial conditions have improved. Um, the fiscal stimulus is no longer being withdrawn in that way. Uh, so we think there was a stronger case for the pickup in economic growth that we have that we have uh, written down. Um, but of course, w uh, notwithstanding that stronger case, we could turn out to be wrong for a variety of reasons. Um, if the economy grows more slowly than we expect, um, that is probably a negative factor for the economy, uh, for the budget rather. I mean, it is directly a negative factor in that uh, weaker output growth means weaker income growth, means lower tax receipts, uh, and somewhat higher payments for some benefit programs, usually. Um, as you noted, um, if the economy uh, is weaker, though, then interest rates may stay low for longer, uh, both because the Federal Reserve uh, may react to a weaker economy by holding rates lower for a longer time, but also because uh, financial market participants um, will see with a, with, would see with a weaker economy less demand for loanable funds, less demand for borrowing, and thus lower equilibrium interest rates for a time. Um, so that reduction of interest rates by itself would be good news for the budget because the federal government is a large debtor uh, and makes substantial interest payments. Um, uh, but I think the direct effects um, uh, of the weaker economy on tax receipts are likely to outweigh the other effects on lower interest rates. But it would depend on just how interest rates responded uh, and other changes in the economy. So it's hard to give a clear, a particularly clear and specific answer. Um, in our January, our February uh, outlook, we offered rules of thumb for changes in the um, in key economic variables, uh, their effects on the budget. Um, but in that report, we looked at the effects of lower growth and different interest rates separately. Um, and we did that separately, importantly, because it's hard to know just how much interest rates would go down in response to any given piece of, of, of weak economic news. And I think it would depend crucially on how market participants judge the weakness in the economy, whether they, what sort of signal, what interpretation was given to the weakness and what signal they took from that.
Yes. Uh, um, you're predicting uh, lower than expected uh, corporate receipts for this year, and I'm just wondering if you can put a finer point on that. You know, why that would be? Is it just because the economy is slowing down at your growth forecast, or is it because um, companies are uh, avoiding taxes? Uh, so corporate tax receipts um, are coming in lower this year than we had expected. Um, we had expected. Um, uh, we had expected a pickup in receipts, but we have not, and, and we were getting one, but not as large a one as we had anticipated. And um, our, uh, it's hard to know what to make of that because we don't have detailed data at this point. Um, after a few years, uh, then there will be detailed data available about corporate tax returns uh, that we and other analysts can look at to try to understand better what's going on. And we don't have that at this point. We basically have the overall receipts. Um, the interpretation that we have put on this unexpected weakness is uh, mostly that companies have uh, put off paying some of the taxes uh, that they owe um, in legal ways. Uh, so with the expiration of various tax provisions uh, at the end of last year, uh, corporate tax burdens all sequel would be higher this year. Um, but companies don't have to pay those bills right now. They can pay some of them next year. And there are uh, complicated rules that I cannot uh, tell you, summarize for you. Um, uh, so we think um, you know, what's happening is there's been more deferral of those tax payments into next year than we had anticipated. Uh, more broadly, our projections of corporate tax receipts over the coming decade do incorporate some erosion of the corporate tax base through a variety of tax um, reduction strategies. Um, one factor there would be corporate inversions, um, but another factor uh, is the shift over time of business income from C corporations that are taxed under the corporate tax code to S corporations where the income is generally taxed under the individual tax code. There were a report about that shift a year or two ago and it's been quite been going on for some time now but it's, it's quite consequential. And there are also a range of other tax avoidance strategies. So we do think there is some, there has been uh, and will continue to be some erosion of the corporate tax base. Um, but I think that that effect is not as significant in our, in our projection of corporate tax receipts as the factors that we talk about in the report. And we note that we think there's some increase in corporate tax receipts next year, uh, but then a decline uh, relative to GDP later in the coming decade. Um, and that decline, we think, was really driven by some of the um, macroeconomic factors. Um, we think there'll be some faster growth of labor income, faster growth of wages and salaries and other sorts of labor compensation as the labor market strengthens and that will weigh on corporate profits. Uh, there will be an increase in interest rates we expect and that also will weigh on corporate profits. And there's some changes in depreciation allowances that we think will further reduce taxable profits. So we think those are the, we wrote about those factors, we think they're the most important ones in explaining the contra, we, the contra that we have. But we do think that some, um, there is some ongoing erosion of the corporate tax base. Yes. I was going to ask the same question, so maybe we could just follow on it. Just one more. That $26 billion decrease from your April projection on corporate taxes, I just was trying to sort of understand how significant that is or not. Um, and then s totally separately, I just wanted to ask you about um, if, there, if there's any sense of the budget cuts to discretionary and uh, discretionary and, and mandatory spending, if that is having any impact on on demand, just overall demand out there, in terms of the. So on the first question, the the surprise on corporate tax receipts was notable, but not particularly large. This is a uh, um, corporate tax receipts relative to uh, domestic economic profits. Um, we sometimes talk about as the effective corporate tax rate um, has varied tremendously over time. Uh, it is a volatile series and has been particularly volatile over the past few years. So this is a category of tax receipts that is quite difficult uh, for us and for others to forecast. And I think the revision we've made, we've made in the projections today um, is not uh, particularly unusual uh, given the volatility of that category. Um, on the second question, um, we think that the reduction in budget deficits over the past few years uh, from both increases in taxes and restraint in spending uh, has been a drag on economic growth over that period um, because the principal constraint on economic activity has been a weakness in the demand for goods and services. And increases in taxes or reductions in federal spending tend to reduce the demand for goods and services. 
So we think that the tightening of fiscal policy has been a substantial headwind in economic growth uh, through last year, but uh, we think that effect has now uh, mostly dissipated, so we don't see much effect of changes in fiscal policy under current law of the changes in fiscal policy that are unfolding on demand for goods and services uh, this year or the next few years. And of course, the run-up in debt um, through the large budget deficits, uh, although provide, that provides some stimulus to the economy in the short term, if that debt is left outstanding, then as the economy recovers and expands in the future, that very large increment to debt uh, imposes ongoing costs uh, in crowding out private investment and thus reducing uh, output and income. Uh, there's the other costs that I that I mentioned. Yes. Yeah, uh, Shri Shantyo with NPR. Can you talk about the the growth rates of the Medicare and the Medicaid? Why they're different and what that means in terms of dollar terms for the for the uh, deficit. Um, so uh, Medicare spending this year we think will be about two percent above Medicare spending last year. That is uh, slower growth than the growth in the number of Medicare beneficiaries. So that average cost per beneficiary is actually falling. Um, that is a striking phenomenon. Um, and we wrote at some length about that in our long-term budget outlook uh, released uh, in the middle of last month. Um, the number of factors that are holding down Medicare spending uh, this year, and we think we'll be holding it down over the next uh, over the next decade. Um, and uh, part of that is the broad slowdown in health care costs per person that we have seen in the economy as a whole and in Medicare very strikingly over the last few years. Part of that slow growth over time in, Medi in the next decade in Medicare is um, slow growth in the payment rates to providers uh, under current law, um, even apart from the way doctors are paid, which is a separate complicated issue, payment rates to other providers um, will grow very slowly uh, in the future, and that's another source of, uh, of restraint. Um, it's also true that as new people come into Medicare in great numbers, and the number of Medicare beneficiaries will rise by more than a third over the coming decade just from the aging of the population and the retirement of the baby boomers. Um, but as those people come into Medicare, they come in as uh, fairly young, older people, so they are less expensive than the average current beneficiary in Medicare for that reason. So a number of factors that are holding Medicare spending growth down um, this year and will hold it down, we think, that over the coming years. Um, Medicaid spending is growing uh, much more rapidly this year, I think about 15 percent, and um, that is driven importantly by the expansion uh, of Medicaid coverage under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and we expect that that expansion will uh, continue to uh, produce uh, rapid growth in Medicaid spending for the next few years. Um, our view is that under current law, uh, more states will uh, adopt the Medicaid expansion offered under the Affordable Care Act, and more people will take up Medicaid in the states that have already expanded uh, uh, availability under the Affordable Care Act. So we think there are another few years of rapid growth in Medicaid spending uh, because of that expansion. Um, then, then there's also the question of underlying uh, growth, growth per beneficiary in Medicaid, and that depends importantly on the actions of the states as well as the actions of the federal government um, because states have a lot of latitude in setting the uh, coverage uh, of Medicaid, who is covered, they have a lot of latitude in setting what particular services are covered, and they have a lot of say in how providers are, are paid. Um, so our project, we do project that, that there will be continued growth in Medicaid spending per, in federal Medicaid spending per beneficiary um, for those underlying reasons, but not at the rate that we're seeing this year because, of, because we think once the expansion has phased in, then, they will, then Medicaid spending growth will revert to a more traditional rate. May I follow up on the, the Medicare, when you say the uh, cost uh, controls in current law, is that main to the ACA or are there other laws that also contribute to that? So the Medicare, what I would put it is that the payment rates and mechanisms for providers in Medicare are based on the accumulation of law to date, including what happened under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the Affordable Care Act did lower those rates uh, relative to the law as it stood in uh, early 2010. Um, but the, but there, have been a whole, there are a whole collection of rules um, that have uh, been put in place by the Congress over time uh, that affect those spending rates. And we don't have a decomposition at this point of what is attributable 
uh, in Medicare to the ACA and what is not attributable in Medicare to the ACA. Uh, Jonathan Nicholson, Bloomberg BNA. Um, I'm, I've been struck since February that you guys have talked about the sluggishness of growth in the 2018 to 2024 period, and, and uh, seemingly attributable largely to uh, the, the, uh, the slower growth in labor force. You seem to put a lot of it on that and the baby boomer retirement. I guess I'm curious about, and I'm unclear of in the, in the report, is how much of that. Is it it's 2018 is seen as sort of like an inflection of, of say current trends, or is that more just that for those last like, couple of years you guys do a here's our here's our idea of where these trends are? Is it an inflection point, or is it more of a just a projection? I guess. So let me go back to our picture here of potential GDP. So this is the maximum sustainable output. Um, so. Uh, that does not have a very strong inflection point. It, the growth of potential output does vary a little over the 10 years in our projection, um, mainly because the rate of business investment changes and thus the incremental capital services uh, changes and are other factors as well. So there is some change over time in the rate of potential output growth, um, but that's not the biggest factor uh, what's going on. What's mostly in our thinking um, is that by tw the end of 2017, we think that gap between actual and potential output will largely have closed so that GDP will have finished catching up to potential GDP. And at that, beyond that point, will grow with the growth of potential GDP. So that's why we talk about, and in, in that period, after we think output has largely caught up to potential output, beyond that, we don't try to project the ups and downs of the economy. There will be ups and downs. We don't think we have any capacity to project them. So we just focus on the productive capacity of the economy and the factors that influence that. So, so, so those last couple of years, it's more about, it's less of a, it's less of this factor up, this factor down, than it is sort of a more general, here's our ideas of what those individual. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is it sounds like your forecast up up through 2017 was more about the individual ups and downs, whereas the 18 to 24. 20, so the next few years, we are trying to predict the, what the demand for goods and services will be in these individual sectors and how that will interact with the, the labor market. And, uh, but beyond that point, beyond this point of return, then we're just looking at the growth of these underlying factors. Um, I, I just had two quick things. W one is to say that the slowdown, the growth of the labor force for demographic reasons started a decade or so ago. So this is not something which is happening in 2018, starting 2018, nor is it starting today. Um, uh, the participation rate um, has been falling for, a, was falling up through 2007 before the financial crisis and uh, a severe recession. Then it fell much more sharply, but it had been falling already because of these underlying reasons. And uh, so that, that, that's worth emphasizing. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that I, I don't want to make it sound like once we once output's back to potential output, then it's easy to project what will happen. I mean, there there are extra levels of our analysis in a sense in the shorter term, but the longer term analysis uh, still is rife <laughs> with uh, challenges for us and other analysts in trying to trying to get that forecast right. Um, so. For example, um, we have a view that uh, there are a lot of people who are out of the labor force now who will come back into the labor force as employment prospects improve and wage growth picks up. If we have underestimated how many people will come back, then all else equal, we'll, we'll have underestimated potential output. If we've overestimated how many people will come back, then all else equal, we'll have overestimated potential output. Uh, we think the productivity growth, which has been uh, weak recently, will pick up a little bit still to a lower pace than it had on average in some earlier periods, but will pick up a little bit from where it's been the last few years. And if we have overestimated that, then all else equal, we've overestimated potential output, and, and uh, conversely, we've underestimated it. So it is not easier to predict the underlying um, uh, determinants of economy's productive capacity, although the aging of the population is, uh, is by itself pretty straightforward. Now, how people will react, whether people will continue to retire at the same ages and so on is less clear. Um, but the, but the, the key driver of the slower growth, as you said, is the slow growth of, of labor force. That is hard to avoid given the aging of the population and the leveling out of women's participation in the labor force after some decades of strong increases, as I said. I guess I was just trying to get at was just whether 
you have these couple of years of strong growth of 3% through 2017, and then that 2.2 for the average of 18 to 24. So the implication is that 2018 is some sort of a cliff, and you're not, you're not, not at all saying that at all. all. There's, there's a period of catch-up over the next few years and then settling in at the long-term sustainable growth rate. Other uh, questions? Damien Plato, Wall Street Journal. Um, can you explain the big reduction in net interest payments over the next decade from your previous forecast? What's driving that? Yes, yeah, so we've uh, revised down our projection of uh, interest rates uh, paid by the government, uh, interest rates in the economy in general. And we did that uh, in response to a very careful reevaluation of uh, interest rates that we did as part of our long-term budget outlook and reported at some length in the long-term outlook last month. Um, we started by looking at interest rates during the 1990 to 2007 period, which we look at because it was a period of fairly stable inflation expectations and no significant um, economic downturns on the scale of ones we've just been through. And then we tried to assess what various factors in the future would look like relative to what they looked like in the 1990-2007 period. And we thought there were a number of factors that suggested interest rates would be lower uh, in the future than, they've been, than they were in that past period. Uh, one of those is the slower growth of the labor force. Um, another is a uh, larger share of uh, income going to high income people who tend to save more and thus provide more, with more savings available than there would be less uh, lower, uh, less pressure on interest rates and lower rates. Uh, third factor, pushing down interest rates, uh, is slightly slower productivity growth going forward than we'd seen in the past. Uh, and a fourth factor is that we think there'll be a somewhat larger risk premium. Um, people who hold treasury securities are holding a safer asset than if they hold private uh, investments. Um, and we think given the events of the last uh, several years uh, and some underlying factors that there will be a larger risk premium, and thus that Treasury interest rates will be pushed down relative to rates uh, on other, other securities, other rates of return on capital. So it's a set of factors that we think will lead to interest rates being lower in the future than they've been in the past. But there is another side of, of the ledger. We think there are a few factors that will tend to push up interest rates relative to that past period. Uh, one of those, a uh, uh, very important one, is higher federal debt. Uh, than we had seen in the past. Uh, another one is that we expect somewhat smaller capital inflows from abroad than we had seen in the past, uh, basically as some of the rapidly growing uh, foreign economies uh, make greater use of their savings for investment at home and send less of their savings here. Um, a third factor pushing up interest rates, we think, is the greater share of income going to capital. Um, Although we think that there will be some rebound of the labor share of income from the levels it has fallen to, we still think the labor share will be smaller in the future than it's been in the past. On a fourth factor, pushing up interest rates will be fewer workers in their prime saving years as the baby boomers move from a period in people's lives when they, people tend to save a lot to periods when they tend to be saving little or drawing down on their savings. So we have a set of factors pushing in different directions. Uh, but in our assessment, uh, and again, we wrote about this at some length last month, the factors pushing down interest rates relative to this period a few decades ago will, we think, be stronger than the factors pushing up interest rates. So on balance, we think that, um, say, the second half of this coming decade, that um, rates on 10-year Treasury securities, um, adjusting for inflation, will be about three-quarters of a percentage point lower than they were in the 1990 to 2007 period. So around two and a quarter percent, uh, rather than the roughly three percent they've been in the past. And uh, so that reassessment that we did uh, earlier this summer um, and applied in the long-term budget outlook, we've now applied uh, in our 10-year projections. And by bringing down interest rates on Treasury securities, um, we have brought down the government's interest payments. But I would emphasize that they are still, those interest payments are still quite large and still growing very rapidly. So we think that annual interest payments by the federal government will be ne nearly $800 billion by 2024, more than three times what they are today. So I want to keep, I want to be distinct here. We have made a downward revision, but the contour of interest payments is still very strikingly up. And, and one of these pictures I showed before, you can see interest payments as a share of uh, um, GDP rising from one and a few percent to about 3% by 2024. So again, more than a tripling in dollar terms and more than a doubling as relative to the size of the economy. But less dramatic, uh, a less dramatic increase 
than would be the case if interest rates rose uh, more sharply than we have projected. But this isn't a ne negative or positive necessarily for the American people, right? Because I guess if you have lower interest rates, that suggests it's harder to accumulate wealth and save money. Um, so it, this, it's a, you raise a good but complicated question. The, um, the risk premium point that I mentioned, that really is distinctive to Treasury securities rather than other interest rates. But the other factors that I've talked about are rates that we think would affect interest rates on a variety of securities, and as I said, the rates of return on capital more generally. Whether one wants those rates to be high or low depends a lot on who one is, um, where one is in one's life cycle, and so on. Um, if you're trying to buy a house, um, low interest rates are good. Um, if you're trying to save for your retirement, then higher rates of return are good. So there is no simple uh, correlation uh, between interest rates and what's good for people. And generally, we think more output is sort of good for everyone who gets it, who gets to share in that. But um, interest rates, um, there, are, there are winners and losers from rates being higher or lower. And the other thing I would just say, final thing to add here is that we to emphasize what, what this picture comes from. This, this growth in interest payments is basically growth increase in interest rates. Federal debt as a share of GD, relative GDP, we think will be a little higher in 2024 than it is today. Uh, not that much higher. But interest rates, we think, will be a good deal higher. And that's the main factor driving up that interest payments relative to the size of the economy. Other questions? Um, we don't, uh, SPUD reporters don't get you in public too often, so forgive me for this, but uh, your term expires next January. Uh, yes. What's your feeling on whether you want to return? I have nothing to say about my personal future. Um, I love doing this job, um, and I'm very focused on doing it. And um, I'm going to worry about what happens at the end of the year when we get to the end of the year. I'm not quite sure you'll be the first to know, but you'll be early to know, Jonathan. <laughs> 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 um, but I'm really, not, I'm, I'm really not, not focusing on that now. We have, a, we have a tremendous amount of interesting and I think important work underway here, and that is fully consumes my attention, and I'm enjoying doing that, and that's what I plan to keep doing this year. Paul. Uh, going back to the fall on corporate tax receipts, um, <clears throat> and that's at least related to certain tax breaks expiring at the end of 2013, <clears throat> and more tax breaks will be expiring. Um, your revenue projection um, assumes that the tax breaks that expired <clears throat> will not be renewed and that the tax breaks that will expire will not be renewed. And if, in fact, they are renewed, and I, <clears throat> I don't expect an exact figure here, but if they are renewed, what kind of effect does that have on the deficit? So you're correct that our baseline projections assume that tax policy follows current law. But we do provide, at the end of Chapter 1, a section on alternative assumptions about fiscal policy. And we look at alternatives on both the spending and tax side to give policymakers a sense of what, what might happen if they made different choices. Um, if uh, all of the expiring tax provisions uh, were extended, uh, that would uh, reduce tax revenues by about $900 billion over the coming decade. Uh, and that reduction in revenues, if no other changes were made to taxes or spending uh, by raising the deficit, would then uh, uh, generate about $200 billion of additional debt service. So if all the expiring tax provisions uh, were extended uh, and um, no other changes were made, deficits would be um, almost $1 trillion, uh, sorry, uh, almost $1.1 trillion larger over the coming decade than the $7.2 trillion that we've projected. Is there anything else? Okay. Uh, well, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
As this briefing comes to a close, the CBO's report on the budget for the next 10 years will be available to read on in its